I'll say let's let's go. Uh, where are we from, guys? I'm on the Black Sea uh, in Bulgaria for my first week of sun and beach this year. <laughs> where are you, Deborah? Greetings, hola from Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona, but Deborah, you're from Sydney, aren't you? Yes, from Sydney, but uh, I'm in Barcelona right now. Great, well. great. Sabrina, you are somewhere. My, my software says. You are somewhere in uh, Zane. What is that? I actually don't know. I think the IP is connected to Zane, but yeah. I have no idea where it's that. But I mean, I'm in Benetton, in Italy. Where, where are you in? In Benetton, Padova. Uh, in Benetton, Padova. Okay, yeah. this is where you're from. Okay. Yeah. And Sam, you are in Vietnam, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Tanan, in Vietnam. A long way from my hometown in the UK. In the UK. Great. So, first uh, secret: everybody speaks Italian here, but because Sam is a great Italian speaker, yeah. and Deborah speaks Italian too, right? Can you speak a little bit? But now we're gonna go. We're gonna go with English. And uh, so, guys, thank you so much for for joining. Um, I think this is like the perfect moment in history to talk about this. Uh, we have uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of properties empty waiting for tourists <laughs> and tourists are not coming back anytime soon except in some areas like the beach or stuff like this but generally we are in a situation where tourists are staying home and don't travel etc and uh for for a long time i've been advocating the usage of accommodations not for tourists only but also for people who come for longer stays and especially digital nomads so people who actually work from their laptop and travel the world. And the four of us are digital nomads. Uh, I've started this in 2001. And uh, yeah, I've been traveling a lot with my laptop. And so I, I encountered the problem of finding a place to stay for months at a time. And uh, especially like let's say in Bali, for instance, I used to go rent a guest house for a week and uh, rent a motorbike and then go around the island looking for, you know, those in the fry, or they didn't write this in German, but like rent, or rent, room for rent, or house for rent. And I used to find, you know, very nice little villas and places to stay that was great. Um, then Airbnb came and it was going to solve the problem, but honestly, it didn't 100%. And we're going to talk about this. Um, and uh, in three years ago, I went to Chiang Mai because I wanted to kind of study the new wave of digital nomads. Let's say um, I belong to the 1.0, and then I heard that it was the 2.0. People who were doing kind of the same thing, but probably working a bit differently. And I met many people, and I met Sam there. And with Sam, we, we did this uh, online course for rent your Airbnb for 30 nights or more. And it's a video course we're selling on Udemy and, and other platforms. Um, and I discovered that Chiang Mai, which is completely different. Chiang Mai is a, is a town in Thailand. It changed very much from where I used to go, where there was no digital nomad environment. But when I went there three years ago, it was a city which was like dedicated to digital nomads. And let me ask, let me start with Sam. Uh, okay, first of all, Sam, a small introduction on how you live and how you rent places, and what's your take on, on, on Chiang Mai? Okay. Uh, so how I live uh, has changed quite a lot in the last year or so, um, especially with COVID. But uh, about three years ago, I became what we call a digital nomad. So I started working online, uh, became self-employed, and traveling. Um, the start of that period, I was moving quite frequently. I lived in a place for a month. And then Sorry moved. to interrupt you, Sam. There's a a lot of noise in the background, I'm not sure if it's me. Let me mute you a second. Are you? Uh, let me try to mute myself. It sounds like rain. Not me. It's gone. That solves the noise. Gone. Yeah, maybe yeah. Some, some of you maybe has uh, two strong speakers. And it's kind of coming back. I don't know. Now it's gone. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. If it comes back, just let me know. 
Um, yeah, so I was moving around every month, living in different places for a month. I did that for five months, and then I went to Chiang Mai for the first time. And I ended up staying in Chiang Mai for about seven months. So it was a much longer period of time. And yeah, since then, the last couple of years, I tried to be a bit more stable. So staying in places for a little bit longer. Um, but I've interspersed that with periods of moving around a bit more frequently. Uh, last year, I had a couple of weddings in Europe. So I stayed for a month in Portugal and a month in Germany. Um, but generally, I try and be quite stable. And then this year with COVID, uh, <laughs> it's been kind of an enforced stability. Um, it's been pretty difficult to leave Vietnam. So I've been here coming up for eight months now. Um, and yeah, I work online. I'm probably writing for sustainability startups. And we have a pretty typical digital nomad life in terms of apartment rental. Um, normally, how do you rent apartments? How do you find them? How do you rent them? What platforms do you use? It depends where I am, because in Europe, it's definitely Airbnb uh, pretty much every time, just because there's really no easy alternative. Um, in the Southeast Asian digital nomad places that I've been, like Chiang Mai, Bali, Da Nang, um, they don't really have Airbnb to the same extent that we have in Europe. So there's often Facebook groups specifically dedicated to short and medium term rentals. And it's also much easier in places like Chiang Mai and Bali to just still do what Luca was doing years ago and rent a bike, drive around, knock on doors. Um, but yeah, I'd say that maybe in the last year or so, really good Facebook groups have sprung up to help you find places in these nomads. Oh, so th there's no uh, dedicated booking platform? Like, I mean, I know there are, but uh, you don't seem to use them. And you know them, and why don't you use them? Um, I've heard of them, but to be honest, it's not part of my habit. Uh, like, my habit would just be to turn up to a, a no for a nomad hotspot like Da Nang, um, there will always be a digital nomad group. There will likely be a group run by the local co-working space, and there might even be dedicated Facebook groups for finding accommodation. Uh, so that's kind of my go-to is just to put a post in those groups and be like, hey, I'm looking for one bedroom apartment with these features, this kind of price in this sort of location. And then people come to me and I don't have to go do searching, and it's it's much easier to kind of filter out good from bad offers on that first pass, uh, and then just dedicate my time to actually going in person to visit. Only and, hand. and you're saving on commissions on one hand, but you don't have any reviews on the other hand. How do you see this? Yeah. Um, because you go to see them, so that, that's enough for you, right? You don't need reviews, do you? Reviews can be important, but I think when I met landlords for the place that I eventually rented here in Da Nang, I kind of went a lot more with gut feeling um, because there was much more of a personal element to it. Like I was actually meeting the landlords in real life. So yeah, there were no reviews, but I feel like with that in-person element, uh, I got enough information to make a reasonable decision. and. Maybe I just tell myself that because this time it worked out really well and I got a really good landlord. But <laughs> I think in general, um, yeah, meeting people in real life is a good substitute for the reviews. Okay. Do they ask you any any deposit or term for you know damages uh, and stuff? This place did. They took a month deposit, which is about three hundred ish dollars. Um, other places haven't. I think about the places that I rented in Chiang Mai the last couple of times I was there. Um, the landlord didn't ask for a deposit. 
but I had previously rented with him a couple of times, so he knew me already. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna mute uh, those who don't speak, so we have a better background noise. I'm gonna ask something, Sabrina, now. Uh, okay, and I'm muted. Okay. So, Sabrina, what is your uh, experience? Uh, first of all, sorry, introduce yourself um, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, right, so I'm Italian and um, I've spent like my 20s in London. I worked as a management consultant first and then as a senior project manager Amazon Europe for the past, for the last two years. And then five years ago, I left everything I built that in those years, let's say, and decided to become a digital nomad. Uh, so that was 2015. And since then, I've been a digital nomad working in marketing, uh, strategic marketing. And in the past three years, I've also built my own e-commerce of sustainable stationery. So I create products that are made of paper and uh, sustainable materials. No, you guys have to talk. I think, Sam, you said that you, you work in sustainable copyright. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Talk to each other. We need to talk later. Great. Yeah. So go, go ahead. Sorry. So, yes. Yeah, so basically now I'm a part-time digital nomad, which means that I spend six months or when I'm lucky, four months in Italy, where I have my production, and then the rest of the year traveling. You're doing some kind of, um, I don't want to say that the name of the brand, the other brand, but you know, it's black books for like high quality black books. Yes. You know, notebooks. Yes, I do like notebooks as well. Uh -huh. um, but the quality is obviously, it's uh, everything I do is really like limited edition and the production is a, uh, uh, extremely high standards okay. uh, through like really the state of the heart um, printing and uh, typography type of thing from the old old people and traditions here in Italy so it's something that is really uh, not not mass market that's, oh, that, that's um, original because when I went back to Chiang Mai in 2017 I realized everybody was working on marketing or drop shipping or so basically 100% digital uh, you yeah. seem to be a step ahead you are going back to your country doing something with physical goods and and you use the the internet as a way for you know selling a, a marketing right yeah. is this something rare or is like is a new trend um well actually i agree with you like um most of or maybe like 99% of the people I know who are digital nomads, they're definitely working online and there is like nothing offline or as you said, they do drop shipping. So they're not really involved in the physical part of running a business. Um, I decided maybe because of my background, maybe because I worked at one of the most, uh, or the most, um, the biggest e-commerce worldwide. Maybe I wanted to do something in that uh, field as well. I don't know. It was a dream of mine to actually build a brand that was Italian and in the stationery field because it's something that you know everybody's got their like passion and obsession. And mine was stationery, so I started with one planner that was 2019, uh, and then in the last three years has uh, has changed into something uh, different. Um, something more related to the sustainability, the eco-friendly, like it's not like the usual planner you find anywhere. Uh, I'm a big advocate for changing the world like through small actions. So this planner I make is, um, is all around changing our approach to the world in terms of, again, sustainability. Um, why the offline side? Uh, well, to be honest with you, as soon as uh, Inchiostro becomes, I saw somebody asking, yes, the website is now down for this week <clears throat> because I'm um, upgrading. So it will be back on next week. Um, 
but uh, you know, like a, in a, in a, in the near future, I hope to outsource the logistics and all the offline side, so that I can go back traveling twelve months a year as I okay. used to. How? What, what, okay, I I shared the 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 link in kiostroandpaper.com. And um, what, how do you book places? I remember, I think the last time we met in Padova, you had some trouble in finding a place in your own hometown. Because who are these crazy people who book places for three months? No, in Italy, <laughs> not just here in my hometown, but just in Italy in general is extremely difficult. Italy is like one of the major touristic destination in the world, perhaps. So... If you find something to rent, it's obviously for tourists. And uh, hosts expect to rent at the maximum available price. So uh, this is part. This is gone, Sabrina. It's, it's over. I mean, now, now it's changed with COVID. So that's actually why we have a new discussion now. Most apartments are empty, and okay. people are looking for alternatives. But what what is the was just the price the problem because also there was kind of uh if i remember they were not really trusting they were not really sure oh yeah i mean like obviously having like a guest uh well there are like lots of like laws and rules to respect like if you are, if you rent an apartment for more than a month i think i can't remember now uh you need to have a contract like a formal contract and if you rent for more than three months, you have to have, like the minimum rental contract here is like six months, I think. Uh, I don't know because then I went through friends and uh, friends of friends. So I avoided the problem uh, entirely. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, as, um, as we were talking, as Sam was saying earlier, like when I was in Chiang Mai, I went through, Facebook groups, when I was in Bali, Vietnam, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Australia, uh, everywhere I went through Facebook groups and a little bit of um, uh, Airbnb. But then in Italy, uh, it's absolutely impossible. Okay. Well, it, again, it has changed. Now people are booking longer terms because now there's no alternatives. So Yeah, maybe because in the last year I haven't looked. I've been right, settled. Yeah. So, you know, it completely I completely been... change. I mean, when your apartment is full of tourists, why do you want to get in this new, you know, new kind of people, new kind of contracts, uh, less money, maybe less, for sure, less money in terms of how much you cash. Is it less money in terms of, you know, what stays in your pocket compared also to the time you put in it? I don't know, debatable, but it's new. So people don't like new things. Yeah. Um, but now it, it's really changed. That's why many people are, are listening. They're interested in saying, okay, how can I attract uh, these kind of people? And my bet, and this video is recorded, so let's see it in three, four, five years. In the same way as cities were running, uh, you know, trying to get tourists, they're going to look for digital nomads. It's a completely different kind of demographic. Oh, things are going to, are changing and are going to change. But uh, like from my experience up to now or pre-COVID, definitely things were, as I was saying, like it was impossible to find reasonable yeah. prices, like not reasonable, but like uh, even, you know, uh, and it's not just about the price, it's really like about finding the right, uh, even like uh, as we discussed so many, like uh, so much like maybe two years ago, just having the desk, having the fast Wi-Fi and so on. In Italy, the situation was... Everybody uh, who is forward-looking is buying a desk, is buying a chair, is putting it <laughs> the fastest in. Sabrina is changing in ways you cannot imagine. They um, needed to have this, this very sh big shock to adapt. So if you try again later, you will see. I bet that, you know, in a few years, it's... You expect a kitchen and you expect an office corner, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And but some so of them are going to focus 100% having the best place to work from, and you won't really look at the bedroom too much. No, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know that we we talked about this for like a, a long, long time at the yeah. beginning of trips. So yeah. maybe we needed to just to have a pandemic, a global yeah. 
pandemic to change things, you know. It's yeah, just... it's true. When we launched trips, the the, the title was a kind of accommodation for digital nomads and tourists. Then we had to remove the digital nomads because nobody knew what, what was there. Yes. Nobody wanted to rent a digital nomad, so we removed it. And then the pandemic happened and we put it back. <laughs> so, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. I'm going to go to Deborah now. Um, let's see if your microphone comes back. There you are. Okay. So, Deborah, you are, as many people, you are a digital nomad sometimes with, without even knowing it, like because you start doing things and then somebody tells you, hey, you are a digital nomad. Say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. Right? Because you spend a lot of time out of Australia. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you, you work in the vacation rental world. Yeah. And uh, then we, we take it from there. Yeah. Well, in fact, my previous career was uh, I had a biscuit business. And uh, prior to that, I used to live in London. Okay. When I left London, I vowed that going overseas was not going to be a once in a lifetime kind of thing. You know, this is, you know, back in the old days in Australia, we used to have to book uh, trips overseas six months in advance. Anyway, I wanted overseas to be there regularly in my life. Fast forward to biscuit business, I would go back every quiet season, which is January, February. Then that started to get longer and longer. And then I moved into the holiday rental business where eventually, you know, I could run everything online. So then I started going away for longer. Um, so basically now, or for the last 10 plus years, Yes, I have been christened a digital nomad, but I thought only millennials were digital nomads. So, um, yeah, I can run my business from anywhere, but I don't use uh, my possibility to travel as a way to go and discover the world. My ideal is going and staying put somewhere and actually establishing a life. So where I had my life in Sydney, I had my life in London, and then I also love Nice in France. So... One year, I just decided I'd never stayed longer than a week in Nice. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to stay one month. It was just like luxury. I stayed one month. And I've been doing one month in Nice for the last seven years. I'd like to expand on that one day. And so then I have my life in Nice. So I have three lives now. And it's very they're very distinct lives, different circles of friends, different places to go. And then because of work, I started coming to Barcelona. So now I'm in Barcelona and this is my fourth life. So I like to, uh, you know, they say live like a local. Well, there's no better living like a local when you actually stay put for a while and well, actually. That, that, yeah, uh, 100%. Culture. They say live like a local and stay three days in somebody else. It's not like living yeah, like a local. Exactly. It's a church, right? No. It's just living like a local. Yeah. Well, when you live like a local, you know, you've got your regular places that you like to go to. You've got your, your friends there that you keep in touch with when you move around. And you know, I was just ch chatting with uh, a friend, Jaume, last night. You know, it's like I, I wish that those friends could come and travel. Far uh, Australia is a little bit too far away for that. But why not actually, you know, when I'm in Nice, come visit, come and stay, no problem at all. So, um, yeah, literally for the last 10 plus years, I've been living out of a suitcase. I have my wardrobe now. It's not in my home anymore. I've rented my home in a garage, switched the clothes around. What climate am I going to? And uh, it keeps life easy when you have, uh, you know, only a suitcase of clothes to pick from and you don't collect chachkas and knickknacks and dust collectors. It keeps life very simple. Yeah. So the, the, there's this saying that those who travel live twice, but now we just realize those who ditch the nomad live four times or five times. Yeah. Uh, many times, many lives at the same time. Yeah. Amazing. Well, my only oh, let's go to... Yes. My only problem is that I, I'd like to go and hang out in Paris for a month or two, whatever. And then Amsterdam, I like Amsterdam. Oh, what about a Greek island? And it's like, oh, my God, there's not enough time in a year, you know. It's like one month here, one month there. And, in fact, what's one month? You know, one yes. month in Nice is not enough. I need that to be six weeks next time, maybe have a really good dose of it. So it's like, oh, my God, there's not enough time in a year, you know. <laughs> well, that that's it definition of happiness in a way like when you want to live more not less you know like you want things to last longer yeah okay let, let's uh thank you so much deborah let's go to a question paula is asking so we we're going back to you know the, the, the vacation rental world even if even the, the word vacation rental doesn't work anymore and the world the term short-term rentals don't work anymore we, we have to invent a new term in general 
Uh, I, I call now spaces for rent or whatever you want to do with your life. Mm. So all is asking, uh, and I'm going to ask this again. We do the same the same flow. We go with Sam first. Let me take away the. I'm gagged. I'm mute. Okay. Uh, what are the three main typical preoccupation fear of a digital nomad regarding rentals besides rental price and fast Wi-Fi? Okay. Well, what are you looking in a place when you when you rent it? Hmm. What do I look for personally, or what yeah, yourself, do I? Yeah, yeah. When you look for a place, what is your like? What 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 do you need from a rental from a house? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd like to kind of caveat everything I'm about to say with it's about my personal situation, and I would say that digital nomads now are actually quite a diverse group with a diverse set of needs. Um, there are some who are very financially sensitive for who price will be the main concern. And then there are others who have successfully run their own business for years. And in locations like here in Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe, money, even in Western Europe, money just really isn't an issue for them. Um, so with the idea that there's different subgroups within digital nomads, um, I would say that my biggest preoccupations would probably be the quality of the living space. So like, is there enough space for me to do the things that I know that I do in my home? Uh, so I do yoga. I know that I need you know, a certain amount of space to be able to stretch out. Uh, I have a virtual reality headset that also requires a certain amount of space to be able to use uh, that properly. Um, I know that I work at home, so I'm looking for a decent workstation with a good chair, good desk, quiet environment, cool environment when it's hot outside or warm when it's cold outside. Um, so basically just checking that I'll be able to actually live my habitual life in that space to a reasonably good level. Um, to some extent, I am price sensitive because I know that uh, living like accommodation costs are going to be probably one of the biggest parts of my spending wherever I am. Uh, so it doesn't really matter if I'm in Europe or in Asia um, where the costs are completely different. I know that accommodation is going to make up, say, 30 to 50 percent of my overall living costs. So I'm always looking to optimize that and get a really good deal in terms of uh, the quality of the living space versus the cost. So that'd probably be number two. Um, number three would probably be, probably location. Um, like I personally don't really like to drive especially in Europe where renting a car is both administratively difficult and expensive. Uh, it's way easier in Southeast Asia to just rent a motorbike and jump on it. Um, but at the same time, I still don't particularly enjoy driving through Vietnamese traffic. Um, so I try and live a walkable life as much as possible. And that means that pretty much everywhere that I'm going to go needs to be within a 30 minute walk of my home. Um, so yeah, I'd say the three would be internal well, living. Let, let me ask you because the, 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 in, in Europe, for instance, it's you know if you are if you go to Rome, uh, there's very good places where you should you can rent. They are not below the Colosseum. You have to get public transport. So they are finding this. Uh, many people are, are able to rent now to places where tourists don't want to go, but a digital nomad or a long term. Booking will have no problem staying because once you learn how to get a bus or a metro, you are you are in the center. I guess the same, I guess, in Barcelona. So you say walking because you're in Asia, maybe. Is it? How about Europe? Do you, do you feel in Paris? You have to walk everywhere, or you include uh, public transport in that? Hmm, that's a good question because yeah, public transport in Asian cities can be pretty patchy. Um, yeah, maybe it's better to phrase it in terms of mobility. Mobility. Just okay. than like, you know, 20, 30 minutes away from everywhere that I'm going to go. Okay. But 
because uh, there's a huge opportunity. I'm trying to see from the view of the vacation rental of the hosts who are desperate right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big opportunity here. You can rent places which are difficult for tourists because they, 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 are, they are not in the center. They don't know the city. They want to go want to stay very close to a, a landmark. And, and there are places which are much better even for a tourist, but they are a bit afraid of, so, of the distance. And so yeah. there's a very good chance to rent your place, which is not in the center of the center of the center. Yeah, I would actually say that it's probably better for a lot better. of people yeah, yeah, yeah. because those areas tend to be greener, they tend to be quieter, yeah. Uh, yeah. they tend to just generally be more livable, uh, especially for people who work at home. They want it to be quiet outside, they don't want traffic noise. Um, I've noticed that in a lot of European cities, the cheaper Airbnbs tend to be in locations that tourists wouldn't go, but I actually personally prefer. Yeah, uh, I, I got this yeah. perfect example when I came back from Chiang Mai, I talked to all the owners in Venice and one, most of them told me, what are you talking about? But one of them told me, do what you want. And he has an apartment on an island in Venice, which overlooks San Marcos Square. It's the best view you have in Venice, but you're not in San Marcos Square. And we rented it for longer term, and it's been full ever since, well, not, not now, uh, because digital nomads would say, okay, I'm going to get this ticket for the boat. It's an island, so you have to go with the boat. I pay you know, 30 or 50 euro a month, and I'm mobile on Venice. It's the best place to be as a, as a resident. While you, if you stay in San Marco Square, it's pure hell when there are tourists. Pure hell. You can't live there. You can't even go to the supermarket without having to fight through the, you know, the, the thousands of people. So th that's a really important point. Let me ask you a last question, Sam. Chair, uh, do you need an office chair? I mean, it's like something you look for or just doesn't have to be this plastic kitchen chairs. What, what's your sweet spot there? Uh, I have abused my spine quite a lot. So for me, it has to be a pretty decent uh, lumbar support chair. Okay, so uh, with, uh, it goes up and down, it moves like an office chair. Yeah, pretty much. That's hard to find, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it can be pretty tricky. Um, I've been lucky here that I asked my landlord specifically for that, and he was keen to provide it. Um, this being a digital nomad hotspot, it's a pretty easy investment for him to okay. make. So for all the hosts out there, buy a good chair, and you're going to get... You know, even if your apartment is not the first choice, it goes up in the search engine algorithm in the digital normal of brains. <laughs> and they're going to book your place because they have, they want to, you know, sit down hours and don't break their, their back. Yeah. Take a Great. good picture. Of it. <laughs> yeah. And take a good picture, of course. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, let's go to Sabrina and um, wait a second. Unmute. There you are. What, what are you looking for in? in accommodations? Can you say the same question we, we are, that Paola yeah. asked before? Um, so I was thinking like about my recent searches, like um, definitely the office space, as you were saying, like the desk chair, um, fast Wi-Fi, like all of this is essential. Uh, it is like no escape is uh, mandatory. Uh, in my opinion, um, I've seen <clears throat> some time ago actually a really great spot. I can't remember if it was uh, Madrid or Paris, but I was looking for something and actually they were ahead of the time. So they actually put display um, monitors. So basically, you could plug in your laptop and work from there. And it was um, was nice like to see that you could even have a monitor so an extra big screen but having said that like the office space needs to be there so wi-fi desk and um comfortable chair um well, about comfortable chair are you, are you like sam you want the real office chair or yes, yes? okay yeah. Well, especially that, that's, yeah Sorry. it's even renting the place for like a from one to six months definitely office chair if I'm staying there for like a, maybe one or two weeks, a comfortable chair is enough. You know, if I'm just passing through, it's okay. But if I'm planning to stay for a month, absolutely. Another tip to hosts and property managers out there, when you put 
a comfortable chair, a really nice chair, costs you 100, 200, maybe 300 dollars or euros. Uh, first of all, this is something you, you know, you spend it once and it stays there for a few years. But yeah. the picture is so powerful because it tells the digital nomad, you are welcome. It's like, you know, you won't have to write to me and try to explain me why you want to stay so long, who you are, you're welcome. This is a good place for you. And the same for the monitor. Uh, most people won't use it, but just because the monitor is there, you can write in the caption, great for you working, you know, people will book with you much more often because visuals are more important than text. So it's kind of the confirmation that, that you're welcome. Yeah. Okay, Sabrina, sorry. Um, the second thing that I, but maybe this is just really personal, but I need light, natural light. Me so too, me too, 100%. I always look for places where there is a plenty of natural light because I work on a laptop all day long. I need yeah. to have light. Yeah. So normally like from the third or fourth floor or even higher whenever possible or plenty of windows because I need natural light. And you need maybe a view a bit far, not, not a wall in front of you. Yeah, exactly. It, it really, it really can, can be depressive. If it's the wrong environment, your productivity gets exactly. destroyed, destroyed completely. Exactly. So yeah, and light yeah. for me is essential. Like uh, like Sam was saying, like the space to do yoga. Same for me. I do yoga meditation every morning, so I need to have that space. But I need also to have uh, light uh, to work as a as a professional as a person. I need to have natural light entering the windows. Great. Anything else? So what about noise? Like. Uh, um, I don't, I'm not really affected by that because either I use headphones or, yeah, yeah or actually when I'm like in the mood, I'm concentrated, like uh, I, I can't hear anything really. So I'm really focused. What about like a studio is fine or you go more for a one bedroom so you can separate where you live and where you work? That was actually my third point, like uh, regarding the kitchen, like another personal thing, for example, if I'm renting a place for, I don't know, maybe in, in Southeast Asia, I really didn't care about having the kitchen or, or not, because you go out in the street market and you eat uh, delicious food anywhere, anytime. Or, but in Europe, if, you are, if I'm in Paris for six months or if I'm in London for a year or Madrid or whatever, I need to have a kitchen but i mean a um not like having a fully furnished kitchen but definitely having like a the minimum essential not, not the tourist kitchen which is just there for display exactly. or okay yeah. Exactly. yeah 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 um because as as i want to live as a, um, like a local definitely i'm gonna go out to restaurants and places not like uh, to eat like the local food and stuff but definitely if i'm staying in the european capital for six months like uh, putting aside that i'm italian i love cooking and i like food blah 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 i definitely am going to cook at home otherwise I'm gonna become really fat and really poor, you know, eating well, out every day. It is also sad to eat alone every day at the restaurant three times or two times. You know, I like that, actually. You like that? Okay, <laughs> I don't <laughs> anymore. Okay. Yeah. L let me ask uh, now, Deborah. Uh, Deborah, Sam was uh, mentioning uh, like the, the the percent of uh, expenses for accommodation compared to the rest, but. I think there's a solution here. You have to buy more wine, spend a lot in wine, so your percent of the accommodation goes down. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found a bottle of wine here for one euro seventy. It was delicious, so I'm fine. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so, what's your take? What are you looking for? Are you in a rented apartment right now, by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay. Of course. Um, so, with my my first criteria is has to have a dining table. It's very, very rare that I see a property that has a desk. If it has a desk, it's usually tucked away in some dark corner. And I, I, I don't want to sit at a desk that's not near a window. So for me, light is important. Being able to stretch my eyeballs yeah. to the distance, that's very, very important. So no- What are you seeing right now? I'm seeing the building across the road and it's a very, very wide street and, and sky, which nice. is great. Nice, you see the, the other sky, thing, okay. Yeah, the other very important thing is a PowerPoint at the dining table. 
A what? Oh, plug. A plug, a plug of yeah, course. Yeah, definitely, yeah. This is something that I look for. Where's the dining table and where's the plug? Yeah. Because you know, if, I, if it's across the room, I don't have extension cords. And I have actually, the last place I stayed at in Barcelona, or one of the places I've stayed, I actually switched the furniture around because the TV unit was near the little balcony and the, the dining table was away from the window. So I actually switched it over so I could actually try to see a bit of sky. Yeah, I do the same, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For light or for plugs. Yeah. You want a place yeah. where you don't have all cables around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, in terms of comfortable living area, you know what? I rarely, rarely sit on the couch. It's always here. I have my breakfast in front of the laptop. I go out. I sit here. This is the spot. Having a desk chair is amazing. My place in London is the only place of all the places that I stay in that has a desk chair. And uh, every time I sit in it, it's what, like... What is a desk chair? What do you mean? Like a good chair? The, the chair for the desk. The, Which the, is a good one, a comfortable one, you mean? Yeah, but it's the one that you can put up and down and you can lean back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. The, the, the desk chair. Right. So otherwise, everywhere else, it's always a you know, dining chair. How, but, how good will it... How, how good will it... Would it be, or how important would it be for you when you rent a place to find a chair like this? No, not, not important. No, no. If it's a dining table, then usually the proportions are all right for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The only thing is, like, at, at my place in Nice, because the thing about me with my life and going back to the same places, I stay at the same places. So, you know, I book direct with the owner. I have mates' rates because I've been going back so many times, so many times, and... Um, the thing is that after seven years or so many stays at this place, they have cane dining chairs, which sort of, you know, like it, it hurts. After a while, you're always adjusting yourself to sitting on the cane. And uh, I put one of those beach sponge things, you know, the, the beach mats. Yeah. Sponge, I put that on and it was like, oh, my God, it's a whole new Change chair. Everything. It was an interesting discovery. Yeah. All of a sudden, wow, comfortable dining chair. But um, also being in... In the city, but like Sam was saying, not right where the tourists are, walking distance. You know, even a one-hour walk, I don't mind a one-hour walk. I'm sitting all day and having a bit of exercise is good. Close to transport is good. Close to a supermarket, shops downstairs, that's great. And that's the one thing I love about Europe. In Sydney, you know, we have suburbia where you're in the middle of just residential and there's nothing there. So I like, that's what I like about Europe. Um. Mm, and I think that's about it. You know, light, plugs, dining table. And, okay, this is one really, really weird thing, but I've noticed it here because I have a round dining table. I actually prefer a square dining table or rectangular. Oh, yeah, because you, you cannot put your elbows. Yeah, but as a desk, you know, from my laptop, the, cur the sides curve, yeah. so I can't have a book here or a diary right. or something. <laughs> it's just something really weird, but a circular desk is a bit odd. What about plants? Some people were mentioning some plants to, you know, because plants are difficult to manage, to, to maintain. You know what? Irrelevant to me. I don't, yeah. I don't care. No, no. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my focus is my work. As long as all of these other factors support me in being comfortable to be able to work, then that's fine. So you being bought a digital nomad, let, let me pass the term. I, you know, I don't like terms in general, like categories, but you, you being a digital nomad and uh, a host, a property yeah. manager. Yeah. How hard is it to upgrade a place to make it welcoming both tourists and digital nomads? And let me tell you one tell one thing which maybe is not clear. Nobody has to make a, a decision and say say I don't want tourists anymore. I just want digital nomads. It's just yeah. opening to them too. The same yeah. place you put it in the market with the right price. Sometimes yeah. the tourists will book. Sometimes the the, the long term. How yeah. hard is it to upgrade? How well, expensive is it? It's not It's not hard at all. And as I say, I sit at a dining table. And as long as you're providing a dining table with a plug close by and a comfortable chair, then that digital nomad is going to be comfortable. So the idea is you go and stay in your property. If you can sit there and work and da -da 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 do live like a digital nomad, then it's fine. It doesn't take much. A dining table, comfortable chair, good Wi-Fi, light, then that that's all you need. It's funny you mentioned the going in your, in your place and, and staying there because with yeah. Sabrina, a couple of years ago, we started in trips to make trips known. 
we started going around Italy testing apartments for tourists. So Sabrina got a car and she went to stay in some apartments and she she gave a, a whole feedback mm -hmm. on, uh, on how it is to be a tourist in that case, in the place. Mm -hmm. That was extremely, uh, the feedback was extremely interesting for the hosts. Mm -hmm. and you say they should stay in their own home, but they haven't even started to test their own place for tourists. So yeah, yeah. Would be, you should would... always, I mean, look, Simon Lehman has always said it. You've got to stay in your own property. Yeah. Don't stay one night, live in it because then you'll see, okay, this is missing. Oh, I should have that. Oh, how come I don't provide this? Live in it. And this is actually another little side business that I haven't got going yet, but it is giving feedback to owners. Well, we did it. I'm definitely sure that in, in a few years, there's going to be companies who come to your place and stay there. What do you think, Sabrina? Yeah. I mean, the feedback was so powerful and so interesting for them. They were so happy. We, they didn't pay, right? We made it for free. They gave us the, you didn't pay to stay there, but it was basically a free service for marketing. But mm. no, it was, a, it was a, yeah. like the feedback we had on the feedback was exceptional. Like I remember the apartment in Genova and the host was extremely, I want to say shocked, but uh surprised definitely that i've seen and noticed things that he, he never thought about mm. but also the apartments in Venice, and uh, i can't remember how many i went to but uh, i was looking at things as i travel so the plugs the wi-fi the light but also like other things that were essential for any tourist mm. on top of what was essential as a as a tourist as a digital nomad as i am so looking for the like checking the speed for, of the wi-fi and the host told me oh i thought it was fast and i'm like mm, not fast enough to actually upload anything like not a video or something but like not fast for me for example mm. but it was a really interesting and i'm sure uh look at it sometimes or actually anytime soon somebody will actually do that like go yeah. to a post and uh, do what we did three years ago yeah, yeah. The, you, know, it, you pay a few hundred euros, somebody comes, stays a night or two, and gives yeah. you back a whole feedback, which is worth thousands. It's going to happen for sure. It just takes I've got it. I've got it. I've set yeah. it up, but I haven't got it run, up and running yet. Right. Yeah. right. Definitely, yeah. But, you know, the thing is that, that people really should stay in their own place. If they're renting their place, they should see what does it feel like for people to actually stay in my place. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes you go and you say, how, how is it possible there's not even, you know, a, a tissue for drying my hands? I mean, in the kitchen, yeah. there's this yeah. basic things still missing. And the only way is, is actually to do to go and stay. So, and now we yeah. can upgrade this to also test it for longer stays. I'm definitely sure there's yeah. a business there. Okay, yes. um, we have a question from Pierre, but Pierre, I don't know if you're going to answer because your question is most, well, let me read it first. Okay, uh, because we don't have much time left and it's, it's, uh, it's a very big subject. So tax implications for living in different countries and internet securities, if you're working for a corporation, right? And you go connecting your laptop to mm. some random Wi-Fi's. Uh, I just give you a quick, a quick answer. Uh, I won't do a whole tour, but uh, yeah, tax implications. Once you are not spending more than six months in any one country, you kind of arbitrage and you, you decide where you pay your taxes, which is something corporations have done for decades. Now we can too, right? That's kind of what people tend to do um, in general. Um, the, the digital nomad e-residency visa you probably heard about Estonia. This has nothing to do with tax. Uh, this basically you pay taxes where you live, but where do you pay them if you don't live anywhere? Well, you do the same as Apple, Google, Facebook, and Airbnb. You pay them where you, you, where you want, or you don't even pay them. You do this uh, sandwich. No, we, we have to pay them, but the big corporations have ways, like the, the Irish or the Dutch sandwich is a way to have a corporation in Ireland, another one in Holland, and you pay nowhere, basically. So we, we, haven't, we are not there yet. We still have to pay our taxes, but uh, it's, it's kind of arbitrage is open to the individuals right now. And in terms of um, connecting, you know, security, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's a relative problem. I have people or friends who work with, you know, network administrative um, security for Cisco and stuff like this. Uh, it's all 
you connect to VPN basically. Um, that's that's what I understood so far. So uh, it's not that big of an issue. Often the issue is more on the co on the company side who is not ready for that. But if you're an expert in these things, there are ways to, to make it safe. That that's my take. It's not complete, Pierre, but um, I just wanted to give you some 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 feedback. Okay, so we still have about eight minutes. Um, let me ask you one thing, and I was introducing this at the beginning. Uh, for years, and Barcelona is the best example, C countries and cities try to att attract tourists because tourists bring money. Then the tourists come, and then you start complaining because there are, there are too many of them. And then the tourists leave, and then you start crying because they left, right? Um, and my answer to this is longer, longer stays. Digital nomads is just a term again, right? People who come for a month to retreat have the right mix of tourists and people who stay longer. Uh, if a pandemic happens like this, they're not going to run away. They're going to actually stay put like Sam in Vietnam. And another friend of mine, Stefano, he was also stuck in Vietnam for months. Uh, so what is, um, what is your take, Sam, on cities like you've been to Chiang Mai, you are in Vietnam, you, you travel around. What should cities do with digital nomads? And like a few days ago, Croatia started trying to attract them and Bali started to try to attract them with a special visa. What is your take on this? Are digital nomads going to be finally trying to be attracted and not like of kind of tolerated? Let me give you the, okay, there you are. Yeah, that's a super interesting question about what cities can do because at some level, there's individuals who really try and attract digital nomads to places. Um, there's a really famous digital nomad called Johnny FD, who's trying to build Sri Lanka into a big digital nomad population. Uh, I'm currently thinking of going to a town in Bulgaria called Bansko, and there's a guy there who runs the co-working space, who is really trying to build a community of digital nomads. And you know I'm in Bulgaria, right? You know I'm in Sofia now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, come yeah. see me then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm um, talking now, but yeah, come see me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe you even know him, uh, Matthias something. Um, no, no, I haven't been to Bansko yet, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's basically trying to build a community of digital nomads and make it as welcoming as possible uh, a place for digital nomads to go. And those are kind of individuals who are making places more attractive. And then at the other end of the scale, there's kind of, national governments that need to adjust the visa regulations to make them more acceptable to digital nomads, um, especially digital nomads who want to stay for longer. Um, I'm thinking about the situation in Thailand where you can do some arrangements with tourist visas and some education visas to stay for longer and longer and longer, but it's always a bit tenuous and they're clamping down on the rules. Um, just having a clear and uh, legal option for staying longer periods, like six months, nine months, or a year, perhaps, uh, with the option to renew that uh, and the understanding that, no, you will not be able to stay indefinitely, but yes, you can stay for, you know, one or two years as an extended period. That's something they can do at a national level. At a city level, um, I think it would be something kind of like what they do here. They actually have a city-run co-working space um, that's largely focused on local startups. Vietnam has a lot of um, app development startups, so it's kind of focused on that, but they also accept uh, international digital nomads. And I think if cities were willing to build the kind of digital nomad infrastructure or encourage those kinds of things like um, co-working spaces, then that would actually make those places a lot more attractive because one of the things that we come for is the community of other nomads. And I think if you could merge that with a local entrepreneurial community, then that would be a really big pull for a lot of people. Yeah, because I remember in Chiang Mai, one evening there was some, some girls talking about YouTube channels for free in a bar, that's where we met actually. The next day there was a Bitcoin meeting, and the other day there was some startup meeting. 
the, the cultural aspect of digital nomads coming to your city or to your island are incredible. They, they transform from a tourist boring place to a really connected hub. And if anybody from a city is listening, I would say, try to start this race before all the others, because this is going to be going to stampede. Oh, every country, every city is going to try to become a digital nomad hub uh, yeah. in a few years. So start now. We were talking with uh, with Simone in Como a few months, uh, like a year or more ago. Como is not the best place for, for digital nomads because it's really expensive, but uh, it now is the right moment to start this. In a year or two, maybe it's too late and everybody's going to run, run trying to attract them. Um, let me finish with a question from Damian, which is actually very to the point here. Okay, Wi-Fi, how fast? What is your minimum standard? And uh, of course, it depends on what you do. If you're doing video production or webinars, okay. But if you're doing just, you know, working online and writing emails, different. I guess everybody today is at least doing some uh, remote calling like Zoom or Skype. Do you have any number in your head? Um, I, I'm going to start. If it's below 10 in download, uh, mega MBPS, and below 1 in upload, it's a no-go for me. Uh, I would like a 50 up and 10 down. That would be good. But yeah, below 10 and 1, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even stay. What is your take, uh, Sam, since you have your microphone up? Yeah, so I guess I have a good perspective on this because I used to work with online courses, which meant a lot of videos. Uh, so I would probably have much more demanding numbers than Luca, especially for upstream, because I was always sharing them and uploading them. Now that I mostly do writing work, um, my requirements are a lot lower, but I would always just say, just get the fastest. Uh, uh, like no one is ever gonna not appreciate the fastest possible connection and eventually you'll have someone who's trading Bitcoin or who's doing video work who needs super fast up and down um, so I think just get the fastest you can so there's no number like because uh, you don't get the number before you book usually right it's like you ask and you try to figure out how this yeah. works like you go there and you test it. Yeah, I would go there and speed test it with a few different mm. speed tests. And then, um, yeah, I guess I have a vague idea like you do that, you know, 10 and 1 is a good yeah. thing to aim Plus, you know, in, in a certain city, you know that the guy, if the guy or the girl has this kind of, of connection, you know that it's going to be that fast for us. So, yeah. yeah. But to answer to Damien uh, and what Sabrina did in the test and what I've been doing with my... Uh, listings forever, you do a speed test and you publish it in your listing. That's all. And it's a speed test. It's not what the company tells you, right? The company tells you you have 10 in download and when you test it, it's five because that, that's nominal, but we want to know the, the real one. And you take a screenshot of the speed test page and you put it in your pictures. Uh, Sabrina, what is your minimum speed? Uh, I think like um, I'm around your numbers, uh, what you said earlier, but I always do that. Like before booking any place, I always ask for a screenshot. I send them the link where to do the test and then ask them to send me the screenshot. Always. Like, it dep again, it depends where I am. Like, um, but like in Southeast Asia, I rarely ask because they have uh, some parts, like not maybe Myanmar. But Vietnam, Thailand, and Bali, they always have good uh, Wi-Fi. But um, in Europe, I always ask them to send me the screenshot in real time. Wow. And uh, now this is getting important even for tourists. People come for a week. You know, people are going to do something online. And uh, and at the other end, very, like, maybe 0.01% of, of hosts are doing this, are telling you the speed of the internet. Yeah. Which I find crazy because it's, it's a very important point data point so cheap to produce it takes a minute and still yeah. is not there so here is another opportunity i guess for absolutely for anyone. as you were saying earlier and sam was saying earlier i think like uh, you know the digital nomad population let's say is going to be just one tiny um part of the people moving around in the next decade 
like everybody's going to be moving and working from other places whenever they can. Like I've, I've, been, I've been talking to people uh, that six months ago were living in Milan in their offices and right now are experiencing uh, living a digital normal life, maybe like in the countryside of Tuscany, not really far, but for them it's something exceptional because they just had the opportunity to actually move their office from central Milan to maybe their hometown or a new place and the company they work for gave them the opportunity to do that. So hosts need to think, as you were saying earlier, that is just not just this us weird digital nomads moving around, but in the next one, two, five years, everybody is going to do that. And everybody not, will want to know how fast it is. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you are, if you if you're given the opportunity to move, even if you have kids, to a better place, closer to the sea, closer to the mountain, you can carry your work with you. Everybody's going to do that. Yeah. So. Oh, most of the people, I mean, I'm not saying 100% of well, the people. Well, I would say that m most of the people who come to your place for whatever reason are going to need a good internet connection and they're going to ask or, or want to see how fast is it. Yeah. Just to say, I have internet, which could mean anything. You, you could have a very slow or limited data, data SIM card, won't do anymore. And as Sam is doing, sometimes 4G is much faster than landline. Oh, yes. There's an option. There's a backup. So, yeah, let, definitely everybody should go very deep into this. Uh, a, a very easy way to remember, this is going to be as important as hot water. Don't take it for granted. Power shower, a lot of hot water. Don't give me any, you know, crappy, tepid water for you know, really fast internet and tell me how fast is it. Okay, uh, so, uh, sorry, Deborah, what is your take here? Are you? Uh, yeah, internet for me, I don't do a lot of uploading or downloading. You know, I don't watch movies or anything like that. So for me, internet, it doesn't have to be lightning fast. Um, and if I have any issue with uh, the speed, I can usually call the manager or the owner to say, you know, bump it up while you're here because this is a bit primitive. But the funny thing is the place where it's the most primitive is Sydney. <laughs> so we've got really, really bad internet in Sydney. Otherwise, in Europe, I haven't had any problem. And where where I did have a problem, it was actually a fault with the line or something rather, and it got repaired. So for me, the speed is not a problem. Um, I think, yes, it is going to be, uh, it's going to be like hot water. And I agree with Sabrina. I think the numbers are of digital nomads, families, are going to skyrocket because, you know, you've got all Twitter, you've got all Google, you've got all Facebook. They're not going to go back to the office anytime soon. And I, I was just chatting again last night about this. Anyone with kids less than five years old, they're going to be taking advantage of this and they're going to be going and living in another country and paying next to nothing in rent and experiencing whatever until such time where that first child has to go to school and then they have to go back to, okay, now we put down roots. So I think it's not just the single person traveling or the couples. This is going to be small families now that are going to be able to, to do what we do and do it easily. Um, now, I don't have a family, so I don't know, you know, what sort of internet you need when the kids are watching their movies and you're doing your Netflix, or, I don't know. But I do, uh, yes, internet is very important. And yes, the digital nomads stroke families, uh, it's, the number is going to increase significantly. Well, for, for a family, you're going to need, you know, there's going to be two or three people connected constantly and a couple of them are looking at videos. So, yeah. I mean, the fastest internet you can get is, yeah. is becoming a must. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. I think we, we gave uh, very interesting information to anybody who is, who is running a, a place, uh, one or many. There's a lot to measure, but the, the most, in sorry, a lot to digest but the most interesting thing is like the effort is really low and the up the up you know the, the, the returns can be really really high so uh, my suggestion would be and, and my prediction is to re you know remember when if you went to paris people will ask you in what hotel are you going to stay and then to, to, nobody asks you this anymore they ask you where are you going to stay because hotels used to be the default for accommodations and they are not anymore. Now, 
when you rent a place, people are asking you, where are your tourists coming from? That's over. Tourists are not the default anymore. People are coming for many reasons, for different lengths, from different, for different reasons in the, and from different countries too. So tourist as a default person who rents your place is over. It's not over everywhere. There are some places where uh, people, only tourists will go, but it, it changed completely. We were kind of expecting that change in, in a few years. Now it's much, much faster because of COVID. So for anybody working in this industry, my suggestion is just, you know, study this thing and, and upgrade because the world has changed. Uh, as for trips, and we didn't talk about like portals too much because the short term for anybody who's in this business is to upgrade your place for longer stays. But the next question is how am I going to get my customers? And Sam was very, what Sam said was very interesting is group, Facebook groups, etc. I think there's going to be booking portals where you're going to find these places and you know they have fast internet, you know they have a good chair, and you know you're not going to pay 12 12 percent commission every month like in Airbnb, right? So either Airbnb or is going to lower the commissions because you can't pay for six months all this money or other companies will do this. Trips wants to do this, like to give you a very, very low uh, commission or have you got from Deborah is going to do this. Um, so we can I see. Luca? Sorry, can I, uh, look, the thing about staying somewhere longer, why on earth you would go through an online travel agent or OTA, Airbnb, why would you do that? The owner's paying commission or your paying fees. If you're going to stay somewhere long, uh, long term, month two, whatever, you should be going direct to the owner because they're going to be able to, they're going to give you the best rate and overall you're going to end up saving money over the year or while you're away because you know you're you're losing money or the owner is losing money on commissions so no, i would be because there's a lot of offer it's easier to find and you feel protected but then if i'm happy to spend 50 percent commission for a three night stay i won't mm. do this for three months or six no, months it's just too that's much. Right. so something is going to change uh, even booking.com now is testing a bit longer stays in 30 30 yeah. days so yeah. uh we're gonna see trips is trying to do that have you got is another solution here which is like don't pay the, those big commissions so we're gonna see a lot of innovation in this, in this but right now what everybody should do is upgrade and get ready for this new wave of, of people so great we went over a little bit but that was really really interesting thank you thank you all of you and uh, I hope it was interesting for our listeners too. There's going to be a video on the YouTube channel. And I hope to see you somewhere soon. Come to yeah. see me in, uh, in Sofia if you come to Bansko or something. If I can get a frame, take me to yeah. Sofia. <laughs> I will be back and down with her. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank and you. thank you, Deborah. Have a nice day. Uh, thanks, thank, you. Yeah. Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.